Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. My name is Bill Benson. I have hosted the museum's first person program since it began in 2000. Thank you for joining us today. Through these monthly conversations, we bring you firsthand accounts of survival of the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Jewish Holocaust survivors are those who are displaced, persecuted, or discriminated against due to the racial, religious, ethnic, social, and political policies of the Nazis and their collaborators between 1933 and 1945. This included inmates of concentration camps, ghettos, and prisons, as well as refugees and those in hiding. We're honored to have Holocaust survivor Frank Lieberman share his individual personal account of the Holocaust with us. During our program, please send us your questions and let us know where you're joining us from in the chat. Frank, welcome. Thanks for agreeing to be our first person today. Glad to be here. Frank, we have so much to hear from you today, so we'll start right away. You were born in Germany in 1929, just four years before Hitler came to power in 1933. Will you tell us about your family and your early life in your hometown of Gleiwitz? Uh, Gleiwitz was located between the place where my parents came from. In other words, it, it was between Boyton, where my father's family lived, and Oppeln, where my uh, mother's parents and siblings lived. And here we see your parents, right? Yes. This is in Schwindlermühl, which is a resort place which was about uh, three hours from Gleiwitz. And uh, my parents loved to go there. They had both skiing in winter and hiking uh, during the summer. Tell us, tell us more about your parents, Frank, please. Uh, my father was a physician, a, an ear, no throat surgeon. Mm -hmm. Uh, my mother came from a family which uh, had uh, lived in Oppeln for well over 150 years. Wow. And uh, they had a family business which celebrated its 100th anniversary in uh, 1933. Uh, the sign there is J.J. Olga. Uh, it had uh, upholstery materials uh, on the right and um, uh, uh, bell drive belts on the left, tripe riemen. And of course, leather for various areas of from shoemakers to uh, people who made uh, fancy equipment out of it. And, and as you said, the, the business in 1933 celebrated its 100th anniversary in yeah. the family. That's incredible. How about your, how about, uh, your other side of your family, your paternal uh, yes. uh, grandparents? Uh, my father's parents had a small hardware store uh, where my grandfather was uh, a salesperson and my grandmother was a bookkeeper. They sold basic hardware and also baby furniture and uh, uh, baby carriages, etc. Uh, and, and notice you have a, being a kid, you've got a bandage on your knee there in that photograph. I probably I probably <laughs> fell playing tag or doing something of that kind. It sounds Nothing like serious. It sounds like you spent a good deal of time with your grandparents on both sides. You knew them. Well, my parents bought bought a small car ah. mainly to visit uh, uh, both parents and uh, stay in touch because Gleiwitz had a streetcar network where you could get along anywhere and uh, there were very, very few cars. That's the reason I frequently rode my bicycle and uh, uh, 
went around around town by foot. And, and this was the family car here? This is my grandparents' style, which was particularly nice because it held a lot of people. And we used it uh, for various excursions. And that's uh, that's you with your maternal grandmother in that picture, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. Frank, tell us some about some of the activities that you and your family did. Well, as I said, we did skiing, we liked hiking, and one of the excursions with that shire was to take uh, uh, go to local forests and look for mushrooms because. My grandmother loved to cook with mushrooms. And uh, you've probably heard that some can be quite poisonous. Mm -hmm. So my uh, grandparents and uh, my mother's siblings were quite adept at knowing what to pick. And I still remember that at the end of uh, the picking, we all put everything on a table and anyone could veto a mushroom which looked uh, maybe borderline or where, where they weren't sure. So with many meals, we never had any problems. But so you didn't have to argue for or against a particular mushroom. It was just the right to say, not that one. Exactly. Yeah. And and, and, and we had veto power. Veto power. And you love mushrooms to this day, I believe. Yes, I do. <laughs> Frank, <laughs> um, in 1933, the Nazi regime began to enact anti-Semitic laws limiting the participation of Jews in German public life. But in Gleivitz, where you lived, you were in a unique situation because of post-World War I border agreements between Poland and Germany. The two countries had signed a treaty that protected minorities in this border region for a 15 year period. Tell us how this treaty affected your family in those first years of Nazi rule. Uh, this, uh, this treaty was signed when Poland was really reestablished. It used to be a country and then became part of Russia and Austria. And when it was reestablished, re the borders uh, had a lot of people from who spoke other languages. So there was a 15-year period where people could move and were guaranteed not to be harassed uh, on either side of the border until they chose where they really wanted to live. That was after the plebiscite. So, so essentially, there was this agreement that for a 15-year period, minorities um, and Jews and others would be protected from discrimination for that 15-year period. But, ev but eventually, that 15-year period, you knew this, was going to end. It was in, in uh, the summer of 1936. And my parents and several friends decided it'd be a good idea to be out of the country during that time to see if there would be any violence. So we took a vacation in Denmark. And when we came back, back, a lot of things had changed. We knew it was coming. So one of the things that uh, I remember vividly was that I was told I had to learn how to swim because we might have to take an ocean voyage. Yeah. Meaning your parents were already thinking about the possibility of moving. Frank, during that period before the treaty ended, um, in the rest of Germany, of course, the very harsh anti-Semitic laws were in effect. Um, what was your life like during that period? Was it relatively peaceful or, or what during that, that period before it ended? It was relatively peaceful. We did uh, change to uh, an all-Jewish school in three, uh, rather elementary school in three classrooms within a school building. Uh, there were also, uh, we knew what was going to happen, that we'd be restricted from going to uh, parks, 
playgrounds mm. and uh, we made uh, we made preparations for its coming but didn't know exactly how severe it would be right. and one of the things you shared with me is during that period um, kosher butchers were were allowed to keep their shops open in that part of Germany where you were located what what did tell us what your community did to support that uh, kosher butcher that you had in your community? Well, there were about uh, 1,200 families. And in order, and there was just one uh, uh, congregation. In order to support those people who wanted to be kosher, everybody decided that uh, they would use a kosher butcher, whether they were kosher or not in order to keep them in business and uh, help out their neighbors. You know, Frank, um, the parallel in my head is um, if suddenly we were told the Civil Rights Act of 1965 would expire tomorrow, um, that, that you could go back to doing what happened prior to that, that's the situation you sort of faced. So when that treaty ended, how did it affect you? Uh, a lot of things changed. When we came back, there was a lot of graffiti on the, uh, on the store windows of Jewish shops. There, uh, there was a Sturmer uh, display, and that was a public that was a publication, right? It. The Sturmer yeah. was Goebbels' propaganda newspaper which showed uh, Jews as have being particularly ugly, almost uh, rather satirical figures, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, were basically universal propaganda. Also, uh, there was almost complete censorship. You weren't allowed to listen to foreign radio stations. And uh, there were a lot of laws restricting movements and what you could do. Also, uh, bank accounts were frozen that you could only uh, withdraw whatever was nece considered necessary for your livelihood. Hmm. Uh, also, there was a uh, brown shirt stationed at, in front of our apartment house where my father also had his office, uh, threatening people uh, with loss of jobs and all kinds of things if uh, they wanted to go to the office. My Frank father also lost his uh, ability to uh, uh, collect insurance. Germany always had socialized medicine, which mm -hmm. meant that the government uh, deducts a tax and you're entitled to go for any treatment when it's needed. So uh, if you couldn't collect it, he basically knew that he couldn't make a living. So between blocking people from going to his practice, taking away his um, ability to collect insurance, his um, hospital uh, pr privileges, basically put him out of business as a physician. Correct. Frank, during, once the treaty um, passed, of course, along with all those other brutal restrictions, um, there were also laws that affected education of Jewish children. Jewish students were um, restricted to the numbers that could attend German public schools. And you described a moment ago that you were attending essentially a Jewish school inside a larger school. What changed for you uh, from from an, in school once those rules took effect. And I think we have a picture of um, your first day of school. Yes. The, those cones that everybody's holding were filled with candy in order to make school sweet. Which, of course, um, now is not going to be very sweet for you. Tell us tell us what it was like for you to go to school at that point. Well, uh, of course... Uh, Jews lost all rights and protection of the police. 
Therefore, it was important uh, to be safe, primarily to stay away, away from groups. Individually, we were hard to recognize. But uh, for instance, going to school, we were told to come five minutes after school started and were dismissed five minutes early so that uh, we could disperse and uh, get home safely. So that give you, basically give well. you a head start on the, uh, on the hoodlums. Exactly. Frank, before we continue, I'd like to um, let you know that we have a lot of people watching today and listening to you. We have viewers joining us today from Arizona, Florida, and New Mexico. And we have international viewers from Finland, India, Israel, and Jamaica, as well as students from Mrs. Miss O'Brien's eighth grade class and Miss Hinchliff's sixth grade class in North Carolina. And we also have a question that's come in for you, if you don't mind taking that now, Frank. And this is Sadly. this is our viewer named Miriam. Um, and she is um, she says, Dear Frank, I am an English teacher and a history teacher in Baden Baden in Germany. I would really like to know your whole story, but above all, I'm interested in how your teachers and fellow students reacted to the laws against Jews. Uh, we had a very nice, I, I remember my first grade teacher, mm -hmm. Miss David. Uh, we basically had a good education. The classes were fairly large because we had to do with limited space. One of the things which I do remember was that the most critical and dangerous time was during a forced recess around lunchtime, mm. where we found it was where the, uh, boys were on one side, girls were on the other, and we found it to be relatively safest to be just between them, near our teachers, to, uh, to have some degree of protection. Mm -hmm. Frank, thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned uh, a little while ago that uh, in anticipation of maybe taking an ocean journey, you learned to swim. As the, as the laws became more restrictive and harsher, your parents began to think about and look for ways to leave Germany, including your mother took a trip to Palestine. Tell us why she went there and, and, and what happened. Basically, she went there with her brother in order to uh, investigate what the possibilities were and found out that there was... Uh, a doctor for about every hundred people. Uh, so she came back and pretty much uh, eliminated Israel or rather Palestine as a place to go because my father enjoyed his practice of medicine and uh, uh, that's when uh, we uh, thought of going elsewhere, preferably the United States, if we could get an affidavit in order to be able to emigrate there. So Frank, um, uh, because of what you just said, your father did end up making a trip to the United States in January of 1938 to see if it would be possible for the family to immigrate there. But the immigration process was very complicated in the 1930s. Discriminatory quotas limited how many people could immigrate to the United States from various countries, different quotas, different countries. For all potential immigrants, the bureaucratic process was onerous. It required large amounts of paperwork and most notably, visa applicants had to get the affidavit that you spoke of. Tell us about an affidavit. What was an affidavit and about your father's efforts to try to get an affidavit for his family? Uh, my grandfather was a genealogist and uh, traced the family's history back to the early 1700s. He did find out that uh, one of the uh, ancestors married um, uh, 
similar family uh, who emigrated first to England and then to uh, Philadelphia and became quite prominent in Philadelphia. In fact, the name was Gratz and uh, uh, they founded Gratz College, which still exists mm. in uh, Philadelphia. And uh, also Rebecca, who is a heroine in uh, Ivanhoe. Uh, the other uh, person that we knew of was somebody who had, uh, uh, again, where the son-in-law asked to borrow a substantial amount of money from my great-grandfather in 1905 and uh, uh, promised to repay it within a week. Uh, it turned out that they used that money to emigrate to the United States and never repaid it. But he did know that they uh, lived in New York and uh, he t my grandfather told him to uh, look up Charlie Marcus, who at that time we found out was a vice president of Bendix Aviation, and uh, which is a forerunner of uh, Sperry Rand. So this is the person your dad was going to go to 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 then see if he could get an affidavit from him. First, he went to the archives in Philadelphia and found out that the Grat, that Rebecca Gratz never married, so there was no uh, family to trace. Got you. And her brother had moved west. West was Louisville, Kentucky. Right. But uh, the family wasn't traceable because he had, he had married and uh, the fa uh, we weren't able to trace the family. So, so Charlie Marcus was... So the he went back to yeah. Charlie Marcus and uh, did get uh, an affidavit guaranteeing that we wouldn't be on welfare for a year. That and, was a requirement for uh, coming to the United States because so, so in 1938 words, was the second wave of the Great Depression. Right. And uh, so as you were hard. That was a big step for someone to give an affidavit because they're essentially guaranteeing that they would support them if the person couldn't support themselves for that one year period. So your father was able to get Charlie Marcus to give the affidavit, David, returned to Germany, but there were many more steps to go. What happened next? Uh, with that affidavit, uh, he went to the American consulate in Berlin and got a number to be called up for a physical and uh, uh, the actual uh, visa, which, by the way, was going to be good for 120 days mm. if and when we got it. Uh, we waited for a couple of months and nothing happened. And my father uh, called a friend and said, uh, is there anything that I can do to expedite this? Because I'm really getting anxious. I can't make a living and... Uh, things are getting much worse. So uh, he suggested getting a box of candy for uh, the secretary to the council, a certain Fräulein Schmidt. Uh, he proceeded to get, get a nice big box of candy and a month later, still nothing happened. Uh, he called his, his friend again and uh, said, didn't you put a hundred marks into it? 
In other words, put money money into the box of chocolate. Into the box of candy. So she got another box of candy. And about two weeks later, we were called to uh, uh, the consulate to take a physical in order to get uh, the final approval of uh, the visa. At that point, my father took the next boat to the United States and took, got a first, the cheapest first class ticket because at that time they still had rules that if you were visiting the United States, you could take a fairly substantial spending allowance, which you could then take into the United States. That was if you sailed on a German ship, right? Correct. Right, right. Of the Fra North German Lloyd. Frank, what what motivated your parents to make the decision that your father would go in advance without the two of you? So you two, you and your mom stayed behind. Well, <clears throat> uh, the requirements to practice medicine is to take the state boards uh, in, in the field. And uh, uh, he picked Ohio because they passed 50% of the applicants, which was a fairly high percentage. Mm. So uh, he left early in order to save uh, money again it was a depression he couldn't work and he had to live off this spending allowance he rented a room in cleveland for five dollars a week and uh, used the medical school of uh, western reserve university as a lot uh, for the library because he had taken english uh, during his uh, college days and was proficient enough to uh, read, read well and uh, get a head start. We came at the end of the 120 days. Before you go there, Frank, two things. One is I'd like to just remind our audience to please share your questions for Frank uh, via our uh, chat feature. So please do that. Frank, before we uh, turn to you coming to the United States, a couple of other questions. Um, while it was just you and your mother, your mother was having to make all the preparations for moving. Um, so would you talk a little bit about that? And I do want you to t tell us about the incident where you broke your arm. Uh, we had a garden plot on the edge of town, which about half a dozen families, the same people who, who by the way, went to Denmark during this time, uh, which we could use as a playground and had a cherry tree and a pear tree. And uh, uh, it was kind of a recreation area at the edge of town. Playing tag, I broke my arm. Of course, uh, I was fiercely independent. I didn't tell anybody. I just said, I want to go home and rode my bicycle. And of course, one couldn't call uh, an ambulance or anything like that because that uh, you probably wouldn't get serviced. Right. Therefore, I was able to ride with one arm. My mother immediately called the orthopedist in uh, the local hospital, whom she, she knew because uh, they, uh, with professional uh, events, they had dinner with them. And uh, she thought that was the most likely place to go. When she called him, he said, sorry, I don't treat Jewish patients. Uh, I can't help you. She frantically called various other places. 
and did find somebody in uh, Boyton, which uh, uh, where my father had grown up, who said, uh, take a taxi and go to uh, the back entrance of the Catholic orphanage in Boyton. I'll see you there and I'll take care of it. But be sure to go through the back entrance because I don't want to be seen with you. Uh, he did set my arm and uh, gave my mother instructions on what to tell my uh, pediatrician when uh, the, uh, she took the bandage off after about six weeks and uh, gave me physical therapy and my arm is in fine shape. In fact, it bends even better than my right arm. Frank, uh, that, that little incident you just described speaks volumes. Something as straightforward as a broken arm in a child, it was that difficult to get care for you. You can imagine what it was like for other other Jews who had any kind of illness or anything. Thank you for sharing that. Before we go on, um, a couple of comments, if I could, that I'd like to share with you from our audience. Emma writes, thanks for sharing your story, Frank. We're tuning in from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And Denise says, hello from Twinsburg, Ohio. I love listening to this channel and appreciate your presentation. And then we have a question for you, Frank. Um, and it particularly, I think, appropriate in light of what you just described about riding your bike with arm, one arm. Adele says, uh, sir, thank you for sharing your life with us. As a child, what gave you strength to get through those difficult days? Uh, my parents were, gave me a lot of independence. In other words, uh, cars were not a danger. So that... Uh, I pretty much went to see friends, go to the playground, do things by myself, and uh, you develop instincts of what you could do and what you couldn't do. And I must have had the right instincts because uh, I managed very well. So Frank, uh, here you are with your mom. She is having to try to figure out what she could take with her to the United States to range that, which was uh, an ordeal. Um, I, I would like you to say just briefly what that involved, because um, I think it's extraordinary what it meant to take anything out. You had to pay an extraordinary tax. And I, I want you to tell us about how your grandparents reacted to you and your mom and dad moving to the United States and when, when you last saw your grandparents. Well, first of all, the rules at that time were still relatively lenient, that you could take anything along that, was you, that you had been using, and uh, rather if you paid 100% tax on its value. Now, since uh, money was frozen, it really did. Uh, we used it in order to uh, try to make life as inexpensive when we got to the United States as possible. My mother uh, arranged for a lift, which is like a container uh, today, in which we uh, were able to take basic furniture, uh, my father's office furniture, like uh, uh, instruments. Uh, she even was able to buy a new audi uh, audiometer, which is a machine which tested uh, hearing loss. Mm -hmm. It was one of the things I liked to play with in the office because you could turn an on and off various frequencies in order to test the whole range. 
That was a brand new invention at the time that uh, he used very well when he got to the United States. So your mom is, she's trying to make sure she can take things that are going to be essential to the family and essential to your father getting started in his practice. We, we have a... She also uh, arranged for the, uh, the packing. Friends, by the way, offered to pay rather to pack my bicycle, which I was very fond of, mm -hmm. and said that they can put it in a small box to make it, uh, to take as little room on the lift as possible. So uh, they brought it to us. Uh, and uh, when the lift came, a customs inspector, uh, checked everything off to see that it was properly taxed and then sealed it and uh, it was shipped off to uh, the United States. Frank, this was in the beginning of October. We have a, a, a photograph here of you with your mother and uh, your maternal grandparents. This, I believe, was taken the last time you saw your grandparents what, what do you recall of what that was like for you and for your mom? Well, uh, my grandfather was quite upset that my father was taking his only daughter to a place where, uh, to a place that's very far away, but uh, did understand the circumstances. Mm -hmm. We stopped there. This is already a suit that I got for emigration. It came with a pair of shorts, which were usually what kids wore, and also a pair of knickerbockers of the English style, which went pretty far down. And uh, this was kind of a goodbye photograph. Mm -hmm. And my mother's brother, accompanied us to uh, the ship. I and, the, and the ship you took from, from the port, uh, port city of Bremerhaven. What, what happened when you got there? Well, first we had to stop in Berlin in order to get our a passport stamped with a J so that any country which prohibited Jews from coming knew that we wouldn't be welcome. And that was almost all countries. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anyway, we waited about four hours at the Berlin police station in order to get that valuable stamp in order to be able to get out of Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, we then proceeded to Bremerhaven, which is the port of the city of Bremen. And... Uh, when we got there, there was no ship. Uh, we knew nothing about that because Germany had almost complete censorship. You weren't allowed to listen to foreign radio stations. All papers were pretty much closed down except those which were authorized by the government. And we knew nothing about uh, the Munich conference where uh, the prime ministers of Britain and France uh, sold, uh, that they gave Germany the Sudetenland of the Czech of Czechoslovakia without their approval. Mm -hmm. This was uh, at that time, Hitler threatened war already. He uh, recalled all ships at sea so that uh, we didn't know it, but uh, the schedule lost f uh, four days during that conference from the recall uh, where Prime, uh, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain of England said, 
we did this treaty for peace in our time. That peace in our time lasted one year. And so and, it, uh, the, our result, voyage was the last uh, day to make up the schedule, which was generally from Sunday to Sunday. Mm -hmm. But in this case, uh, uh, no, it was Saturday to Saturday, I'm sorry. Uh, but in this case, it came on Sunday. And by the time we got to New York, that was on a Saturday after a six-day voyage. So, Frank, from what you've described, Hitler got what he wanted, and the ship was able to sail. You made it to the United States, and you and your mother were reunited with your father in late October of 1938, and your family settled in Ohio. Tell us what the adjustment was like for your family and for you particularly to establish yourself in a new country, a new life. Uh, again, I considered it an adventure. My mother told me everything would be better when we got to the United States. And uh, uh, after a rather perilous uh, sea voyage where she was sick and wasn't able to get out of the cabin for four days because in October that was in the hurricane season mm -hmm. and we had a very, very rough voyage. Uh, but uh, I considered everything an adventure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, we, have a, we have a photograph, I think, coming up that... Yes. Um, that sort of summarizes for you uh, what your adjustment was like. That's what we'd call an all-American picture, isn't it? <laughs> uh, actually, my father picked us up in New York. And uh, after the two-day sightseeing trip in New York, uh, where for five, for five cents, you can could get on the Fifth Avenue bus and go through Central Park, the Empire State Building, and a uh, uh, lot of New York. We uh, proceeded to Cleveland, uh, where he was studying and where we stayed for about three months because... Uh, uh, he was booked to do his uh, state boards in December. In December. So, Frank, before you move on to that, of course, um, you hadn't been in the United States very long. You were in Cleveland for a very short while. Um, when you were home and your parents were out and, and a phone call came from Germany, tell us about this. Yeah, my parents went out for the first time I believe it was a Wednesday, in order to get a special of a midweek sale of a movie. I don't know whether it was 10 cents or 25, but that was their first going out. And uh, they asked a neighbor to kind of look in on me every half hour. Uh, at about nine o'clock that night, the phone rang, I answered, and it was a person-to-person -person phone call from my mother, from my grandparents. That was probably the longest hour of my life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I knew something was definitely wrong since nine o'clock at night or three o'clock in the morning in uh, Germany. And uh, uh, they called person to person, which there were two classes at that time when phoning was very expensive. You could call station to station where the person answered and uh, whoever it was, it was co uh, connected. If you really wanted to uh, get a particular person, you called person to person, which was about 
two, three times as much. But uh, obviously, the news wasn't going to be good. Mm-hmm. Finally, my parents came back at about 10 o'clock and heard the news from my grandparents that the business had been confiscated, that two of my mother's brothers were imprisoned, and that the business, and that uh, uh, things were in shambles. Uh, and this was what's known as Kristallnacht or Night of Broken Glass, when uh, hundreds of synagogues were burned down, uh, store, stores were confiscated, and uh, that I consider is the beginning of the Holocaust. Mm-hmm. And that was the night of November 9th through 10th, 1938, just literally about two weeks after you arrived in the United States. That must have been so, just so terrifying for your mom and dad to, to know that that was going on with the rest of the family in Germany. You would, as you said, you remained in Cleveland while your father was preparing for his boards. So you started school while you were in Cleveland. What was that like for you? I mean, first of all, you're, you're in a, not only a new culture, but a new language. Well, I had been tutored for about uh, four months when we definitely decided to uh, that we were able to leave for the United States. I'd been tutored in English, so I knew some English. And as a pre- at that time, there were no TESOL or uh, programs for uh, speakers of other languages. Mm-hmm. So they simply put us back about a year. And I was uh, very happy to have a very, very friendly and helpful uh, third grade teacher in manual who spent some time after, after school to help me uh, and to figure out what I knew and what I didn't know and where I needed uh, help and where uh, in some cases, I was uh, ahead, uh, depending on the curriculum. Mm-hmm. Frank, um... I, I did mention that after Crystal Night, my father immediately took a Greyhound bus to New York to see Charlie Marcus, uh, telling that he doesn't need any money from Charlie, but he needs uh, an affidavit uh, for my mother's family. Unfortunately, he came back empty-handed because uh, he obviously knew about his father's uh, borrowing of money and uh, he turned on he turned him down. And, and of course, Frank, your father was still preparing for his boards. He wasn't working. There was no way that he could offer the guarantee of financial support to give an yes. affidavit himself. So that was not an option. F- Frank, um, your father, now, now he picked Ohio because they passed 50%, one half of those who took the state boards, but your father fortunately was one of those who did pass when he took it. So you then, your father, it was time for him to rebuild his medical practice in Ohio. In Ohio. So tell us what that was like for your father to begin to rebuild his practice. I think you moved to Dayton, Ohio um, to do that. Right. He moved to Dayton because there was no Jewish ear, no throat surgeon. And uh, uh, it was suggested that that would be a good place. Um, He did open his practice on uh, Valentine's Day, 1939. And uh, uh, that's when we started 
our new life. But it was a rocky start there for a moment with his practice. Please tell us about that. All right. <clears throat> At that time, the key to legitimacy was to join, to be, uh, be accepted in the medical society. He immediately put in an application for it. And uh, the result was that the, they decided to have an emergency meeting on a Friday night where they passed an ex post facto law requiring citizenship for any new, for any new members. The process of becoming a citizen takes five years. So that obviously was meant to do a roadblock mm -hmm. for his uh, for resettlement in Dayton. Uh, now, one of my favorite saying is when you get a lemon, try to make lemonade. As it happened, somebody called uh, the Dayton Herald or with the, uh, the Journal Herald, I think the two had merged, which was the Republican morning newspaper. And uh, uh, the reporter came in, rather called that he wants to see his credentials. He came in on Saturday morning, uh, spoke to my father probably for about half an hour to get his background and uh, said, thank you. The next morning, the Dayton Journal Herald had an editorial captioned freedom of opportunity in the United States in which they described what had gone on, the fact that the meeting was on a Friday night which was restricted to some Jewish physicians and that this law had been passed and uh, Monday morning, my father had 11 new patients. As a result of that editorial appearing in the newspaper. As a result of that editorial. And that was the start and of it. I had been a great mm. supporter of a good free press. I can see why. Frank, um, uh, be, as we get towards the end of the program, several other things are really important for you to share with us. As you described, your, your father was unsuccessful in getting other family members out of, journey, out of Germany. Please tell us what happened to your family members and then about his what he did to bring people out of Germany after the war, which is just remarkable. But first, Tell us about the rest of your family. Uh, unfortunately, none of them really made it. My mother's two uh, twin brothers were both on an Italian ship on the way to Shanghai, which was one place where one could still go. At the time when the Nazis invaded France and Italy decided to uh, declare war and therefore the ship couldn't get through the Panama Canal. Suez Canal, right, yeah. Yep. And uh, they went back and we never knew the exact history except that a few years ago when the archives came out, I did find out that the two brothers, uh, Heinz's wife and daughter all ended up in Auschwitz. My grandparents on both sides were, went uh, to Theresienstadt, 
My father's father died almost immediately when he got there, and the other ones were uh, transported out in 1944. Uh, we didn't know this until after World War II. Uh, until the war was over, because again, you just didn't hear anything. No, and then, and, but, and uh, therefore, my father couldn't do anything for his family. But by that time, he were by the end of the war, there were many, many displaced persons in various camps who couldn't get back to the places where they came from. And uh, he uh, was a volunteer head of the Jewish Family Service in Dayton and uh, gave, I think, 107 uh, affidavits of guarantees that people wouldn't be on welfare uh, during 1945 and uh, through 1948, when the crisis really uh, was the most severe. And uh, uh, as a result, was a very proud recipient of the international highest anniversary reward award together with President Truman. So President Truman and your father were recipients of this award. There were five. Yeah, but five, were and they were two of them. And, and, and Frank, just so our audience understands, 107 people came to the United States successfully because your father made that commitment, financial commitment to support them if need be, by, and gave them the affidavits. That's just remarkable. Um, I think... Um, I think we have a video question now for you, if you don't mind taking it. Uh, this is from a student by the name of Harper uh, from Arlington, Virginia. We're going to see her now. Hi, my name is Harper, and I'm from Arlington, Virginia. And my question is, how do the effects of harassment as a child affect you today? Frank, Harper's a a question is, how did the effects of harassment that you experienced as a child how do they affect you today? Uh, I'm very sensitive to any injustice. And uh, uh, I guess it gi gives me an outlook that if everybody does well, we all do well and it's helpful for our uh, for our country and the world. And uh, I believe in supporting the general welfare wherever I can. Frank, I have just one more question for you today. And that is, in the face of rising global anti-Semitism, tell us why you continue to share your firsthand account of what you went through, what you experienced during the Holocaust? Uh, I think it's important, and I kind of repeat, that if everybody does well, we all do well. And I try to fight tribalism and uh, injustice because it makes, it's just good for the general welfare. That's why I support the museum. I also like to say that the museum is a wonderful institution because it fights injustice and calls attention to it. And uh, I just think it's a wonderful institution. Frank, thank you so much for being willing to be our first person today. You have shared with us as much as you could in this one hour, and there was so much more for you to say.
but you have given us such a powerful look at what it meant to try to, when you made the decision that you wanted to get out of Germany, how difficult the barriers, the hurdles uh, that existed. And, um, and just thank God that you and your mom and dad were successful. And um, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I would like to take a moment now to thank our donors. First person is made possible uh, through the generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation with additional funding from the Arlene and Daniel Fisher Foundation. And I also want to invite you to join us for our next first person program next month on December 15th at one o'clock p.m. Eastern time for a conversation with Holocaust survivor and museum volunteer, Nat Shafir. Nat was six years old when a priest betrayed his family, revealing them as Jews to the fascist Iron Guard in Romania. Nat's family was forced to quickly pack some of their belongings and leave their successful dairy farm. Please join us in December to learn about Nat's efforts to care for his mother and sisters when his father was taken for forced labor. Thank you all for joining us today for First Person with Frank Lieberman.